You're starting, so amen. It's it's it's, but it's all God's got a blessing with your name on it, with your name on it, amen. We thank the Lord for amen, amen. If there are any first time visitors, we thank the Lord for you also. Uh, and we have amen with us, amen. A dynamic, a national, somebody said national. national evangelist and uh amen amen and my wife and i we had followed her ministry amen i think that was when we were with ed ella thomas we were kind of following her ministry at that time when we were there and so we've always enjoyed her ministry we followed her ministry a long time amen and there's a lot of things i could say and i know that she's a retired principal and um and I know that, you know, she's the founder of Grandma's House there in Visaya, uh, Tulare. And um, she's doing some great things over there, helping kids and uh, to have a place to come in and I believe to be tutored. And, uh, and amen, she's done a great work. She was over the women's ministries um, when Bishop Johnson had asked someone, he had asked her to be over the women's ministries. And um, amen, we've always worked well together. We've always worked well together. She has been a blessing. She is a blessing. So at this time, I'm going to ask that you sit in prayer, amen, as our own national evangelist. Amen, amen, uh, Flora, amen, Sister Flora Johnson. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, all to see how great, how great is our God, oh, he's a name above all names, he is worthy. and great God we serve. He is a name above all names. And he's worthy of all praise. Uh, he's worthy when I'm up and he's worthy when I'm down. He's worthy when things are going well. And he's worthy when they're not. He's just worthy, worthy, worthy. How great is our God. How great is our God. Truly he's altogether wonderful. Lord have mercy. I don't know what I would do without him. I don't know how other people are making it without him. But I praise him for his love and care. 
I praise him for his mercy that endured from one generation to the other. What a wonderful God we have. And, and, and more wonderful than that is that we belong to him and he belongs to us. Wow. It's one thing to praise somebody else for what they have that's great. And it's another for you to have what you're praising about. Truly, I honor the Lord today. He is so real in my soul today. Somebody say, his love just bubbles over in my soul. The songwriter went on to say that some people say that they believe they don't believe in God and they don't believe in his word. But I believe in him because he's so real in my soul today and his love just bubbles over in my soul. I want to honor the Lord in this household for being here today. First, giving honor to the pastor, Elder Jones, and all the ministers, and Pastor Cano in the back, and for the uh, youth pastor, Pastor Cherry. I praise God for being here today. God is the head of my life, and I have just enjoyed my 52 years this year of walking with him. He's just been wonderful. You know, 50 years is a long time to do anything. So that tells you he must be all right. I stayed. <laughs> I could have done a lot of other stuff, but he's real in my soul. I praise him. I know him to be a keeper. And I know that he can keep the young as well as the old because I started out as a young person. As I was sitting there, I thought uh, the first time I think that I heard the Lord speak to me, I was 18 years old and I was seeking for the Holy Ghost. And the Lord showed me my whole life from eight years old to 18. And when he got to the point where I was at 18, he spoke to me and he said, I was with you all those years and you didn't know me. And when I reflected back over those 10 years from eight to 18 and saw all the times when I felt nobody was with me anywhere, it broke my heart and the tears began to run down my cheeks like an ice cube melting under fire. And he said, I'm going to fill you with the gift of the Holy Ghost. And in less than five minutes, I was speaking in other tongues as the Spirit of God gave out of us. So I love him today. I've had a wonderful life. It's been a wonderful journey. I tell the kids sometimes because I was a school teacher for 20 some years before I went into administration, did a lot of storytelling and I told the kids, sometimes I feel like uh, I've lived the fairy tale with all the princesses and Snow White and, and first one and the other. And they had their struggles, but th at the end of the day, they lived happily ever after. So I've had the fairy tale and I've had the ups and the downs and, and I've had times of when, when I, I didn't know if I could make it or not but I stand to say that God is a good God. And not only is he good, but he's a keeper. Wow, I love him. I just love him. I want to also give honor to First Lady Jones. I, I just love her. Uh, every now and then she'll send me a, a card for Mother's Day or some special occasion. Uh, she just seems to always remember people. It is good for us to remember each other. We don't know what each other is going through. And maybe that card or that phone call is just what you need for that moment in time. I also want to thank and praise the Lord for Sister Karen. Sister Karen is my prayer partner. And I think it was maybe three years ago, if not four, Sister Karen called me and she says, the Lord has laid up on my heart to have a prayer group. And I want you to be part of it. And we're going to, I think our first endeavor was to pray for Sister Crystal Crenshaw. Because Sister Crenshaw was very ill. And Sister Karen had that on her heart. So every morning when we got up at 6.30 to pray, we remembered Sister Crystal Crenshaw. And I'm sure others of you were praying as well, but you see what prayer will do. When they say it can't be done, God says it can, and I will. So I want to get on into the word. I want to invite your attention to the book of Esther. 
And I'm going to read a small portion of the 14th, of the fourth chapter and the 14th verse. When Sister Cherry asked me, I think it was at the fellowship meeting, if I would come and I would speak to the young people, I said that I would. But I didn't start to work on it till last week. And I said to the Lord, I either said it or thought it. I said, Lord, what is it you would have me say to these young people? I'm going to ask those young people to stand up. Everybody that considers yourself a young person, stand up. Because this message is for all of us, but it's for you specifically. So when I asked the Lord, what should I say to these young people? And I don't know about other pastors and preachers, but it takes me weeks to get messages. He never just makes it easy. He never just tell me the whole thing. He'll throw a piece here and somewhere driving down the street, there's another piece. <laughs> and later on somewhere else, there's another piece. And then it comes together. I call those staples on the shelf. Right. Women that cook, we have staples on the shelf. Yeah. And those staples, you can make anything. You can make meatloaf. You can make cookies. You can make pies. You can make. So I had staples on the shelf. And then a couple of days later, he said to me, they are leaders. You were born to be leaders. I want you to hear what I'm saying. I'm not saying something to make you feel good. I'm saying what God said about you, not somewhere else. It does not mean that you're the only leaders, but the group that I'm talking to today, you were born to be leaders. But before he gave me that piece, he gave me Esther, the fourth chapter and the fourth, the fourth chapter and the 14th verse. And I'm just going to read a little of it. And this is a very familiar passage that says, who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. So the first thing he said when I asked him, he just dropped the scripture in my head for such a time as this. That's how I asked him, what should I say to these young people? For such a time as this. And two or three days later, he said, you are born to be leaders. Touch yourself. You are born to be leaders. It is in your spiritual DNA. It does not matter that it may not look like it today. You may be seated. For those of you who know the story, you know that the Jews were in captivity. And you know that Mordecai was the uncle to Esther, the girl which I read about. And he had raised her as his daughter due to an occurrence that had happened with her parents. And Esther had ended up in the king's palace and she had become queen of that country in that kingdom but Mordecai had an enemy and they were out to annihilate all the Jews 
So he sent word to Esther to go before the king, but Esther was fearful because she knew that her life would be in jeopardy if she didn't find favor when she walked in the door. So she sent word to Mordecai what her situation was. King hadn't seen her in 30 days. And to walk in might cost her her life. And Mordecai sent her a message and he asked the question. And I believe that this question spoke to her spirit. Because when God calls us to do things, we don't always know exactly what it is and when it is, it's yet unfolding. But when the right cord is, is touched, it stands up in our spirit. It's like, an aha, that's why I'm here. That's what I'm supposed to be doing. And he sent her this question, who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. When she came to the kingdom, they weren't in trouble. But because God is all-knowing and he knows the end from the beginning, he knew there would be a time when they would be in trouble. And he put something in place. This morning I want to talk to you about divine providence. And the part that you play in the fulfillment of God's purpose and his will. For such a time as this. The word providence refers to God's intervention in the world. In education, we have intervention programs for kids that are not doing well. We put things in place to make sure that they don't fail, to strengthen them to deliver them out of the situation that they're in. Well, God's got an intervention plan too. An intervention is something that is put in place that changes the outcome of a situation to make it better. Intervention or involvement in the affairs of men ensures that his purpose and his will is fulfilled. God's will. God's will is that all men would be saved. Is everybody going to be saved? No. Did he know they would not be? Yes. But his will is that all men would be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. God gives us free will. He gives us all opportunity, but it's left up to us to accept it or not. His purpose is to reconcile the world back to himself. It was never God's will that we'd be living like we're living and struggling and, and going through sickness and all the kinds of things that come with living in a sinful world. His will and purpose was already settled before he said, let us. That's what I love about God. The more that I read about him, the more I understand, and it just blows me away how great our God is. Because he knew from beginning that it was not going to work in that garden with Adam and Eve. And he put a plan in place. And, it, and he had a plan for such a time as this, and you are in it, young people. And the rest of us are too, but I'm talking to the young people today. God governs or intervenes in the affairs of men, and he works through a natural process or order of things so that his purpose is fulfilled. And there are many instances. The young man that was teaching Sunday school this morning brought up John. John was already destined to be the forerunner of Jesus Christ. Even before we knew we needed one, God had put him in plan. That was God's intervention along with Jesus. Also, I want you to know that God has called you for such a time as this, and not only such a time. And I want you to understand the other piece of what I gave you today, and I want you to ponder it. 
Do you remember when the angel went to Mary and told her she was going to have a child that was going to be of the Holy Ghost? She didn't run off doing anything crazy. The Bible says she pondered it in her heart. She thought about it. She turned it over. She searched it out in her heart. I want you to understand that not only are you called for this season, but that you are going to be leaders in this season. And I will say this too, you will not all be at last days. Can I tell you that? God just spreads you out when it's time to go. He sends you. The other part of your what you need to know is found in the book of Ecclesiastes, the third chapter, in the first verse, it tells us to everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under the heavens. A time to be born, even though some people, he names them before they come into to birth. He already got a name for them, such as John. And there's a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up that which is planted. Here Solomon, the wisest man to ever live, tells us that God has a plan for all people. God provides cycles of life or seasons in which we work. And we work in our season, and that season is connected to a time. I thought about it this morning. In the winter season, it goes from, I'm thinking, October to January. But the things that grow in that season don't crop up in October. They may be to December or the 1st of January coming up. Time is connected to your season. You may be in the right season, but the time is not yet. So we don't get discouraged when we're not seeing the fruit of our labor because time has not connected with purpose. I want to say that when I was 26, when I was 28, he told me he was, I, he was with me. And he filled me with his his spirit when I was 18. But it wasn't until I was in my late 20s that he told me I call you for a purpose and it was not to sit down. That's when he called me to ministry. But ministry was already in my DNA. Just wasn't time yet. It was not my season. Purpose was there. But the time had not connected. All of this sounds great, but I, the, the part that, that, that brings the complexity of it is, is that we have an adversary, the devil. Well, and I want you to know that he is a mighty adversary. And he comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy, and he's not taking prisoners. He comes to do you in. That's why you have your struggles. Even though you're blessed and God's got his hands on you, you're going to have your struggles. You're going to have times when you don't know whether you want to go or not. You're going to have your ups and your downs and your, your valleys low. There are going to be times when you're going to wonder, why am I even here? Oftentimes, we don't even come to realize that God has an important part for us to play to way up in the season. I want you to know that Ephesians 2 and 2, that says that Satan is the prince of the powers of the air. And then in the book of John 12 and 31, it says he is the ruler of this world. It only signifies that he has influence and he has authority over the world and the world is under his control. But he's not sovereign. God is sovereign. And God allows him to do what he will do and then God works it out for our good. Somebody say you can't touch that. He 
he works it for our good. God is sovereign. The dictionary tells us that sovereign means chief or highest. He is the supreme power, superior in position, independent and unlimited by anything else. Whatsoever he says will be. And that is how God intervenes because of his power. It's not by our power nor by our might, but it's by his spirit. Wow. God is truly and perfectly sovereign. That means he is highest, greatest being there is. He controls everything. His will is absolute. And he does whatsoever he pleases. I thought about that today. He does whatsoever he pleases. But you know what the key part of that that comforts me is I know that he loves me. Uh, I know because he died... Because he sent his son to die for my sins. Uh, and the Bible says God so loved the world uh, that he gave his only begotten son. So I know he's working it for my good. Yeah, he can do what he pleases, but he's not like man who has the power to do your hurt. And he does it just because he has the power. But he's like a loving father that allows things to make us better. Wow. So we learn to trust him. We learn to love him. We learn to know that whatsoever he's doing is working together for my good. And we rest in that assurance because we know everything's going to be all right. Glory be to God. Satan can only do what God allows him to do. As saints, we have been delivered from the power of the adversary and given power to resist him. But his influence oftentimes impacts us. That's why we pray. That's why we fast. That's why we try to bring our bodies under subjection. Because the influence of the adversary. Paul said, when I would do good, evil is always before me. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Because my flesh wants to do everything everybody else is doing. But the spirit that he gave me. Give me the power to withstand him and resist him, and he will flee. Glory to God. Uh, the closer you walk to God, the better you're going to be. The stronger you will be both physically and emotionally. God's will is that all men be saved. Come to the knowledge of the truth. My purpose is to be a tool in the earth as an intervention for God's will to be yes. done yes. Yes. and for, to fulfill his purpose in reconciling the world to himself. I want to bring to your attention in the book of Esther when we first started out, this girl, I am sure her whole life Sometimes the bad, when the bad and the ugly happens to us, we want to say, Lord, why me? Sometimes kids are born into foster homes and, and they, uh, they very seldom get over it. Or rather they're born and they're adopted into foster homes and, and they struggle with the issue. Why didn't someone love me? Why didn't someone keep me? Why? They have all these questions. I'm sure that this young woman was like anyone else because I know it doesn't matter how good your situation is, you always wonder. Yes, yes. I want you to know that God had a plan for this young woman. And she didn't know it, but God had given her natural beauty. And not only had he given her beauty, but he given her a heart of humility. I heard that this morning in the Sunday school lesson. She was humble. And when she went into the king's palace, uh, she wasn't... Uh, rushing to be accepted. It was God's plan. It was her humility that brought the light to her. It was her gratefulness that she'd come up with that made that king want her above all women. I said that to say 
say that when God calls you out, young people, he positions you. He puts you in the place where you can grow. He puts you in the place where you are going to obtain what you need to fulfill your purpose. He prepares you. I'm going to talk about that a little later. He equips you. He does four things. First, he puts you in the place that you need to be. He put Esther with Mordecai. Because Mordecai had what she needed to help her to develop into the young woman she would become. Then he prepares you. He equips you. And the final thing is he conditions your mind. Because contrary to what some people would believe, sometimes we don't want to go where he's trying to send us. Sometimes we are fearful. Sometimes we think we cannot do it. But I hear, the, I hear Job says that God performs the things that concern in me. He said, am I of one mind and he's another and who can change him? So he had to be conditioned so he could say, not my will, but your will be done. So you know the story how she goes in and she keeps those Jews from being destroyed. Sometimes we are hard on people, but God calls the saved or believers as well as unbelievers to do his purpose. Anybody know about that? We just have to watch God move and trust him. He knows the way that he takes. I thought of the man Cyrus. And I thought of the Babylonian army, how that God used them to punish Israel. I thought of Josiah, because Manasseh was wicked, his father. But when Josiah came aboard, he had a different heart and he tried to get the people on track, but they were so far gone, they could not remedy their situation. And just like God said, they were in captivity for 70 years. But Jeremiah said, you're going to come out. So, so when you're in your prisons, whatever it is, Whatever God has promised you, he's going to overturn and overturn till it happens. Wow. All God wants us to do is trust him. It's hard to trust. You know, we're taught uh, to kind of rely on yourself and, and don't be dependent and all of these things. They're good for some people, but when you're talking about God, be dependent. Rely on God. Lean not to your own understanding. I don't care where he's taken you or allowed you to go. It's still going to be all right. I don't care how many mistakes you make on your journey. It's still going to be all right. I don't care how bad it appears. It's still going to be all right. Because God takes those things. And he means it for your good. I told my kids the other day, it's like making a cake. I don't like tasting the eggs because they're raw and they don't taste good. And I don't like the, the, the vanilla flavor that you put in it because it's bitter. But once you put it in that cake and you mix it all up, it is a delicious cake. That's what God does for us. He takes the good, the bad, and the ugly, and he mixes it. And it works for our good. It works for our good. It works for our good. And I thought about Cyrus. They were down in there, and they were down for, in the Babylonian capital for over set for 70 years. But when it was time for them to come out, God sent Cyrus. Named him before he was born. That he would be the deliverer of those Jews and he would conquer the Babylonian army. They were the greatest in the world at their time and had not been defeated. But it's not by your power and it's not by your might. Wow. So when you're combating your enemy, 
whether it's on your job, whether it's in your household, whether it's in the things that you're trying to accomplish for God, just know that God is sovereign and what he says will come to pass. Hold on, ponder it, because he'll begin to tell you things. He'll begin to tell you where you're going. I remember when I was the vice principal in my school district, they wanted to send me to open a new school with a new principal and I did not want to go. But I, I, I was there on my knees and I was thanking God for all that he'd done for me and how he blessed me and, and had given me things and stuff. And he said, I gave you stuff cause you needed it. But now it is time for you to do something for me. And he said, they're going to ask you to go to Sims. That's the new school. He says, and when they ask you, I want you to go. Just like I'm telling you. That's why I know that God talks to you. So I went to the mother of the church, Mother Holman, and I said, God has said they're going to ask me to go to this new school, and he wants me to go. She said, well, if it's God, it'll come to pass. That was on a Sunday, a Saturday morning we read prayer. On that Monday, the, I was sitting in a meeting with the vice principals, and the superintendent came up, and he had, no, that Monday, I went to help the lady get her staff for her new school. And she said, I've been trying to get Flora to come and be my, princi my vice principal. And I knew it was God said, all you have to do is ask me, because now I know it's God. She asked me. The devil said, she can't ask you. Superintendent has to ask you. Well, that next Tuesday was the meeting with the VPs. And the superintendent tapped me on the shoulders and said, when you get done, I want you to come upstairs. I went upstairs. He says, I'm sending you to Sims. There was a reason I had to go to Sims. See, God moves you so he can prepare you for what you need to know. There were things I learned at Sims that I was not going to get at, at the Joseph Sims, the other school where I was. But I learned, I stayed there five years. And they decided they were going to move me. I didn't have the confidence that I could do all these things. And they moved me. But I found that when God is preparing you, he gives you everything you need. To, so that when you get that appointed time, you are ready. You're conditioned, equipped, and prepared. And he's preparing you to be leaders. Leaders among all of those that are called for the purpose. Because we all don't have the same jobs. We don't all do the same things. But in the same household, he can give me what I need to be this and give you what you need to be that. It's according to his purpose. And so Cyrus was a different kind of king. Look what God does to our hearts. He conditioned Cyrus as well. Because the Babylonians thought that if you move people out of their countries, they couldn't go back and regroup. But Cyrus felt that they did better in their countries, working together, rebuilding, and his purpose was to get the temple built. And he sent them back to Jerusalem to build that temple. What was that all about? God's will and God's purpose. And God, time don't mean anything with God. 70 years. And he called Cyrus 150 years before he was born. Doesn't matter. We lean and depend on God. That don't mean that your, your appointment and your purpose is going to be 150 years. Because he called you before you were born. He knew you would be sitting in this church today to hear this message. He knew that Pastor Jones would be your pastor. He knew all the things that you've been through that brought you here. And he knew all the things you're going to need to move forth to do what he's called you to do. How great is our God. We need to learn to lean and depend on God. And I want you to know that in that time span, this is the other important piece because sometimes we get discouraged and we feel like we're wasting our time. Sometimes we want more for us than God wants. Can I tell you that? You want to be greater 
than what God has appointed. You want to be the great evangelist when maybe that's not what God has called you to do. Maybe you are the builder. You may be the one that pulled the great evangelist off the streets, gave him the word, uh, and he went forth uh, and created lots of wonderful things. Purpose is purpose, and it's equally valuable. So one of the things is not to want more than God and not to, to get to a point when God begins to use you that you think it's all about you. Somebody say humility. Somebody say humility. Humility. Young woman said today, we are servants. You may, a pastor is a servant to the people. An evangelist is a servant to the people. First ladies are servants to the people. God gives you a pastor's heart that loves people. Everybody can't pastor. They don't love people. They like the job. They like the title. But the spirit is not there. Are you following me? So you want to walk according to God's will and don't want any more. The young ministers used to ask me, Sister Flora, uh, how do you uh, get to be a, a big evangelist and, and you get to do all these things? Say, I don't know about that. All I can tell you is don't want more than what God wants for you. Because what God, what do we say? What God has for you, it is for you. Can't nobody touch it. Are you hearing me? You don't have to fight over it. You don't have to squabble. You don't have to push. Because God's got it laid out. What you do need is a humble spirit and a heart that loves God. And you need to know that you need more than what you've got. You've got that. And I'm almost done. Uh, if you're going to be the leaders that God has called you for, for this day, you've got to live holy. You, we're living in a time when men have moved a landmark. I don't know where we are. I know where I am. <laughs> and my husband used to say, hold what you got, honey. Hold what you got. I'm holding what I've got. You hear what I'm saying to you? All the new stuff that's on the horizon, let it go. Because what the Father's delivered to us, it works. 52 years later, I'm still here. 30 and 40 years, people are still here. And we are blessed. Because God talks with us. Those angels want to know what is man. They couldn't figure it out. They're so weak and, and selfish and hard-headed. What is man that you are mindful of him? But he comes to visit us. Sometimes in the midnight hour. Sister Davis, sometimes when you're on your last leg, he shows up with a song. Or he gives you a dream. Or he sends a stranger to you to say, God loves you. Anybody ever had a stranger tell you, God loves you? How great is our God? It's his will that we make it. And he's given us all things. I think that's St. First Peter, third chapter. He has given us all things that pertain to life. That life is Zoe. And it means the same kind of life that God has in himself, which is eternal life. He's given you all things that pertain to life. And the next big chunk, and godliness. We have got to live godly. The Bible tells us to be ye holy. Even as your Father in heaven is holy, we can't live any kind of way. Now, I want to talk to you just a minute for such a time as this. First, I want to tell you that from the time that you knew you were in the world, because God's always known, up until the time you come to your purpose is, is a space of time it's called an interval between. And in that interval are those four things that God's doing for your life. Because you didn't come in here ready to go. You know that, right? 
You came in here and he got to whip you in shape. You got to get all that stuff out that you picked up from the world for generations. All that generational stuff. All the bad places you've been. He has to clean you up. And when he baptizes you in Jesus' name and forgives you of your sins and fills you with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost leads and guides you. And the Bible said, be not conformed to the world. A lot of us are conforming to the world and we're telling ourselves it's okay, but it is not okay. He said, make a difference between clean and unclean. As young people and as leaders, you got to stand up and make a difference. So he's preparing you. So you, he, he, he positioned you first. Just like he put Moses on that river. See, if he'd put him somewhere else, that, that princess never would have found him. But he had to go to Pharaoh's house. So he had to position him. Are you following me? Had to position him so that he could be located by the right person. And then taken in and trained the way that he needed to be. So he... He positions you. After he positions you, he prepares you. Give me a minute. He prepares you, making you ready for use. We're not always ready for use. We come out of the world bitter, hateful, angry, because of the things that's happened and impact us in our life. He begins to rub all that off through the washing of the water of the word. He begins to clean us up so that we're ready to be used. And then he, he equips us uh, all the necessary tools that we need for whatever the job is. Love, compassion, humility, faith long-suffering, all the fruits of the Spirit that comes as traits of the Holy Ghost, he puts in us, and it works on us to make us better. And then he finally, he conditions our mind. Because we've done all that, but we don't think we're good enough. We don't think we're prepared enough. We don't think we can do it. Like Moses didn't want to go. Lord had to send Aaron. But Moses, at the end of the day, stood up for himself, did his own talking, he just needed a little support till he got there and realized he could. Sometimes we don't know that we can, but we can. So we can do all things through Christ that strengthens us. Just know it ain't about you. Sometimes we miss the boat because we get caught up in us. All this patting on the back and praising you, it's not always in your best interest. Always waiting on somebody to say what a wonderful sermon that was, it's not in your best interest. Are you following me? As long as God has told you, you're leaning on him. When he tells you to go and speak to someone, as long as God told you to go speak, do what he says, it'll be okay. He gets us to a point when he's conditioned us and equipped us and ready to go forth to fulfill his purpose in us. And just like Joseph at the end of the day, he said, you meant it for evil. See, that cake's mixed up and he's tasted it. And he knows it's good. Amen. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. God has a watchful eye. He's always watching us. He keeps an eye on us. He loves us. He wants us to make it. And he's like a parent. Sometimes he let us go through things that whips us. Only because he knows we're going to be better for it. Follow me. I'm going to close with such a time as this. We have been grafted into the army of the law and the Lord. Saints have always been there. We are, we've always had purpose. All of us have purpose. And let me break it down so that nobody feels left out. For these young people, the message is they're born to be leaders for, such, for this time. But God called you to be things too. And some of you are still working up to your purpose. It hasn't hit you yet. But the, but the other thing I want to tell you and make sure you get it, it's not just about the, the purpose that you're supposed to fulfill in ministry for God, whatever it is. 
Number one is that you might be saved. Amen. That's your number one. But some people, just like I said, you may not have the great jobs. Your main purpose, other than to be saved, may be on the corner. Uh, is this last days here? On the corner of last days in this other street. At a certain time, certain month, certain year, because God is sending somebody your way. And nobody can do for them what you're going to do, because that's your purpose. Amen. For such a time as this, what time is this? This is the worst times I could imagine in the world's history. For we are living in the last days. And now they says perilous times would come. I want you to know they're here. And men are lovers of themselves more than lovers of God. I've never seen so many saints on Facebook strutting their stuff. Can I just say that? How much weight they lost. Uh, their new clothes, their new hairdos. Can't somebody say Jesus saves? Not a word about Jesus. It's all about us. We need to be telling somebody that Jesus saves. Dr. Bernadetta Carter was on last week, and she talked about the young woman they witnessed to in the restaurant, and the girl received the Holy Ghost while they were having dinner, and she started to shout and run all around the place. And the witnesses wanted to know if she'd had a hot flash. <laughs> if she'd had a hot flash. <laughs> Dr. Carter said, yes, she did have a hot flash. It was a Holy Ghost hot flash. These are the kinds of things that makes a difference in the lives of people. That's young people what you're called to do, to be an example, to present yourselves a living sacrifice. Is it easy? It's not always easy to be different. It's not always easy to carry the torch. It's not always easy to be the only one that says, no, we can't do this because we're saved. Everybody want to flow the, the easy way. Men are boasters. Proud blasphemers. I think as saints we have more now than we've ever had. Because when I came up we were poor. Disobedient to parents the way kids talk to their moms and dads. I'm hitting my 70s next year. I was pretty good to my mom and my father. He gives us 70, right? I'm hitting my 70th birthday in April. And I'm having a party and you're invited. The Bible say they will be unthankful, unholy. Saints are different. Now I won't say saints. Church people are different. The saints remain the same because they know what's important. They know what to value. They know what God wants. They love what God wants. They want to be found in the center of his will. They're pulling off and putting on so they can please God. It's not about me. They realize that God's coming soon. They're trying to get that ticket in their hand. Too late to run to the train station to get a ticket and the train's in the station. But I've got my ticket. And, and I think it's Marvin Sapp that say nothing else matters than seeing Jesus. That's where I am in this stage and age. It's seeing him. The other part of that is they're lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Saints, we've got to lift up a standard. It's encumbered upon you, not just the young but the old too, to know how important it is that you live godly on your job. So that when people see you, they know it's a different in you. I came to my office once when I was vice principal. And I opened my door and there were people sitting up in there. I have a key. They had one too. <laughs> and so when I went in, the young lady said, I tried to find you, but you weren't here. You weren't here. You weren't here. I was late coming. And she was in trouble. And before when she was in trouble, I had prayed. See? But this time I was late. And so the vice principal, the principal, and the person was there in my office. 
And so I said, do you want to pray? And they said, yeah, we want to pray. So we prayed. This is your witness more than what you, your life is your witness more than what you talk. Talk is relatively inexpensive. But your life is a greater witness. We are the lights of the world. Wow. And when God has brought you out of darkness and you're manifesting the, the spirit of God and the fruits of the spirit, they see God in you. They say, what must I do? I'm almost there. You have been called, young people, out of darkness. Wow. Into this marvelous light. You are light to people that sit in darkness. I don't care how they talk about you at school or at your job because they're going to talk about you first. Think you're better than everybody else. You know they can't do nothing. You know at that old church, they, they somebody preached looking for a cheap church. You don't get much from a cheap church that don't cost you nothing. You can go and live and do anything you want to do up in there. Okay? We're not looking for a cheap church. We're looking where... We're going to live godly, and it's going to cost us something. You have been equipped, prepared to carry the message of reconciliation. And it starts with your life. Whether you're on the basketball court at school, whether you're in your classroom, and you've been asked to help a student you don't like or don't want to help. I'm talking to these little ones, too. They're little ones, but they're going to grow up to be us. And we want them to be strong. We want them to love God. We want them to have a heart that seeks righteousness. The life experiences that God has given you have prepared you and are preparing you for your season and your purpose. I can't tell you when that is. He didn't say. It depends on each one of you. But let me tell you this. When you hit that purpose, you're going to know. Just like Esther knew, she had no alternative but to go before the king. Because it triggered in her mind. That's your only reason for being here. So you have a call upon your life. And God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. My instructions to you are, is to hold on to the Lord. Read the word. Trust God. And he'll bring it to pass. I don't care how bad it is. Can we say amen? Amen. All I can say is, didn't I tell you? Amen. Amen. That was, that was, uh, I was thinking as our theme for such a time as this. Amen. Amen. I keep telling you that God, amen, is calling us at such a time as this. And as I, I've told you before, God knows that there are wars and rumors of wars. God knows that there is pedophilia, homosexuality, amen. amen. God knows, amen, that there's uh, the tra human trafficking, amen, the drugs. God knows the situation and the times that we're living in. That's why he's calling us. He's calling us to, as I heard, to position us, to prepare us, to equip us, amen, to condition us. God is calling you in such a time as this. God already knew the times, and that's why God has always had his interventions. When it came to Abraham, God wanted to start the, the Jewish nation. He wanted to bless the Gentiles in a Jewish nation. He called Abraham. Amen. When he got that nation and they needed to be saved from famine, he called Joseph. Then when that nation had grown so large that they had uh, put them into slavery, he called Moses. And then when it was time, he called David to be the first king. <laughs> I want you to understand that God does not live in time and he works ahead of time. 
God takes care of crises before they become crises. God called people and put them into place so that when the crisis comes, he already has them ready, amen, to help him out in his work. You may feel like you're going nowhere sometimes, I heard the preacher say. You may feel like that nothing is happening in your life, but this is the time for you to position yourself, prepare yourself, equip yourself, condition yourself while it looks like nothing is going on. Because God's getting you ready to have you ready to be put in place so that you can save, deliver, do whatever it is that God has called you to do in such a time as this. Amen. This is going to be a worse time than this. It's going to be a time after the rapture, and it's going to be too late for you, but there will be two witnesses over in Israel who are going to, they're already being called. They're already being positioned. They're already being prepared. They're already being equipped, and they're going to come, Revelation 11, and then that's when, that's when during that time they're going to start revival, but it's going to be too late for the church. The church will be, have gone home. That's when the world, that's when great meteors are going to hit the earth. That's when, that's when the, uh, the, the sun is going to become so hot that it's going to scorch people. And then it's going to turn around and where the sun becomes dark, so dark, that it's darkness that can be felt. That's when the Antichrist is going to rise and cause everybody to take a mark in their hand or in their forehead. We're living in a time, amen. We're living in a time that the church is time for revival. It's time to be on the corner. It's time to, to save people. It's time for you to get saved. It's time for you to get your miracle. It's time. God's trying to, God has positioned us for this time. See, the problem is, let us stand, amen. The problem is, is that we don't want to be positioned. We don't, amen, we want to go back. We don't want to, we don't want to do what it takes. We don't want to hold on to do what it takes sometimes. And I've been that way, amen. From the time God called me to pastor, I heard his voice. He told me where to go, where to start the church, the building, the house, everything, where to go do it. And from that time, I've had dreams, I've had visions, but God has not said to me, amen, about being district elder, about what, you know, about these things. And so, but I know what he wants. I know what he wants, amen, amen. Because I never think about titles. I never think about positions, amen. I think about being saved. But I know what God wants, and I'm, and I'm, like, I'm, like, the, I'm like our evangelist when, when they're going to the other school. You know what? I, I got my own plans. I had my own plans, <laughs> amen. But I heard, I heard, you know what? God said, go ahead and do this for now. Go ahead and do this. We didn't do this because he has positioned us for this. This is part of my purpose. This is part of the destiny that God has called us and that I have been training you for. This is all part of it. And so, amen. I want to say to you in my closing, amen. And there will be a minister's meeting directly after, yes, MIT's or you know, all invited, all the MITs, their spouses are invited. It's only going to be about 20 minutes, maybe yeah, about 15, 20 minutes at the most. And uh, But I want to give you a quick altar call. Listen, God's calling you. You're the one that have to make up your mind. What is God calling you for? What is God calling you to be a part of? God is positioning you and calling you and talking to you to come out, come out of what you're in to do some great things. But it took 25 years for me to get another move of God. I've heard from God, but to get another move of God, it took me 25, 26 years. And it wasn't what I wanted. <laughs> Amen. But I want you to know that you can't rely on it look like nothing is happening. Because there's always something happening when you're in God. I want you today, as you bow your heads, ministers, yes, as you bow your heads, listen, I want you, you to make up your mind. I don't want nobody pushing you in the aisles because then they got to drag you down the aisle. I want you to make up your mind. It's up to you. But I will tell you this, if you come and if you stay, 
And if you, if you learn, there's a great destiny awaiting you. There's a great destiny awaiting you. You may have to clean the church for five, ten years. You, yeah, yeah. But God is still preparing you. And he's positioning you. He's conditioning you for some humility. 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 Is there one today that has never been down in the name of Jesus? You want to go down in Jesus' name. You want to be filled with the Holy Ghost. If you're here today, but it's your time. It's your time. The ministers are praying. They're praying. They're praying. It's your time. It's your time. Thank you. 